and thank you, Ron and Mary, for carrying this incredible vision for all these years and for all the transformational work you've done in so many lives and all around the world. I'm just so grateful to be here to share this very special moment in your lives with all of you. And uh, I am really humbled to be here because I'm not a graduate of the University of Santa Monica. Uh, but if you can graduate by osmosis, I think I have graduated because my sister, Agapis Stasinopoulos, who has been my spiritual mentor for years, graduated from the University of Santa Monica and actually believes that every problem in the world can be solved through the teachings of USM. <laughs> so. so I'm very clear that the issue is not the issue, but how you relate to the issue. <laughs> No doubt that the soul line is much more important than the goal line. I regularly relate to my inner counselor and I do my best to operate from heartfelt listening. And although I know that we are all divine beings having a human experience, and therefore you may think that it doesn't really matter, I just want you to know that from up here you look amazing. <laughs> so I'm sure that when you first started on this journey at USM, little did you imagine that as you're entering this tunnel, and now you're at the end, here is the light at the end of the tunnel, I'm sure you little imagined that at the end of that tunnel, there would be a lady addressing you from behind a podium in a funny accent. <laughs> now, this accent has been a little bit the bane of my existence. I'm sure at USM, you've all worked through things that bother you about yourselves. For me, it's been my accent. In fact, I only really relaxed about it when I met Henry Kissinger. <laughs> now, <laughs> not because of his accent, but because he said to me, Ariana, relax about your accent. In American public life, you can never overestimate the advantages of complete and total incomprehensibility. <laughs> I really try to lose my accent. In fact, I have to tell you something. Uh, my ex-husband gave me a gift, you know, my birthday gift, my last birthday gift before we divorced was to give me a dialect coach for two weeks <laughs> who followed me around and told me everything I was doing wrong. And she wasn't just any dialect coach, she was Jessica Drake, who among other people taught Tom Hanks how to speak in Forrest Gump. <laughs> so, she would, at the time, my children were very young, she would put diphthong symbols um, in Dr. Seuss books so I can practice while I was reading to them. Bottom line, by the end of it, I was completely paralyzed. I knew what I was doing wrong, but I couldn't possibly fix it and be my authentic self. <laughs> so that was the end of my marriage. And... Uh, <laughs> of my trying to change my accent. <laughs> I am absolutely convinced that there is no more important time to be graduating from USM than right now. Because as Ron said, the evolutionary tide is gaining momentum. And we are really going through a tipping point. And you have the opportunity to be at the forefront to be able to really accelerate this tipping point. And this is such an exciting moment for you to be taking all these skills and all this learning out in the world. And the reason why we are at this tipping point is really for me twofold. The first is that the traditional way of living our lives has become unsustainable. The casualties are growing all around us. A Belgian philosopher, um, Pascal Chabot, called burnout the disease of civilization. And indeed, when our lives are measured simply in terms of these two metrics of money and power, 
it's impossible not to burn out. And in fact, we see all around us people living under this collective delusion that burnout and climbing faster and faster is the only way to succeed. And you know better, and you can help the world realize that there is another way and another path. The other reason why this is such an exciting moment and such an incredible tipping point is because for the first time, we have amazing scientific findings that validate ancient wisdom that in fact all the things you have learned like meditation and centered listening and coming from your heart and loving that all these things are actually the way to lead a life that is not just happy, but is actually transformational in terms of the world around us. And now we have the evidence to prove that. So all these things that used to be considered a little new agey, a little flaky, definitely California, <laughs> now have a lot of scientific backing behind them. And as you know, those of you who read Thrive, I have 55 pages of scientific end notes at the end, deliberately, because I wanted to show that we are now in a different world. I remember um, one of the graduates today, a dear friend, Gina Murdoch, um, sent me an email a, a few years ago before she decided to take the course. And she said, I'm standing outside this building this USM building, and there are lots of purple hearts, and this whole thing looks vaguely weird. What do you think? <laughs> and I said, run, don't walk, and take it. And we had dinner the other night, and she's so grateful she did. And that's really what is changing. Things that used to be seen as vaguely weird and strange are now scientifically validated. And they are not just for people who want to chill out under a mango tree. <laughs> They are for people who want to be in the arena and who want to change lives, as you are undoubtedly are going to do. So you've been given so many incredible tools. I want to add one tool to your toolbox, and that's sleep. <laughs> you know, uh, Ron said earlier, that there is this evolutionary bridge and we go from being asleep to being awake, metaphorically speaking. Well, I want to convince you that you're going to cross that bridge much faster when you get enough sleep. <laughs> I know it sounds paradoxical, but what is so interesting as I've been studying this sleep deprivation epidemic is that the reason why so many millions of people around the world have trouble sleeping is because we have valued our lives in the wrong way. Because we think our lives are about our to-do lists and our projects and our goal line. And when we realize that in fact there is something bigger and higher that we all embody, that our lives are about, then surrendering to sleep becomes a natural part of our lives. So for me, adding that tool to your toolbox is really critical. I mean, I've learned that lesson the hard way when I collapsed from sleep deprivation and burnout and broke my cheekbone on the way down. But it was probably the best thing that could have happened to me. Because as we learn, as you learned at USM, as we learn through life, Rumi was right. Live life as though everything is rigged in your favor. And often, some of the worst things that happened to me have been hidden blessings. I remember, for example, in my 20s, falling in love with a man who was twice my age and half my size. <laughs> but love is blind. And, uh, and we were together for seven years, but he really did not want to have children. He only wanted to have cats. <laughs> and I was very clear I wanted to have children. So basically, there I was. I was 30. He didn't want to have kids. He didn't want to get married. 
And I made this big decision, which now sounds like a great decision. At the time, it was incredibly painful to leave him and leave London, where we lived, and move to New York, because I wanted to put an ocean behind us to make sure I wouldn't go back. <laughs> and so when I look back, and when I look at my life, I can say without doubt that all the good things that happened to me, my children, the Huffington Post, uh, being here speaking to you today, happened because a man wouldn't marry me. <laughs> so. <laughs> that when not everything goes your way. <laughs> and more recently, you know, one of the hardest things that happened in my life was when I got that call every parent dreads from my daughter in her last year at Yale saying, Mommy, I can't breathe. And the drive to the emergency room to pick her up uh, after an episode of um, drugs that she had gotten involved in, in her last year. I remember in that drive, even then, focusing on gratitude, on feeling that she had reached out to me, she wanted to get well, she had a loving family around her that would help her get well, and I'm so happy to say that she's now almost four years sober, and again, it's been the best thing that happened to her. <laughs> the other thing that is so different today from any other time in history is our relationship to technology. And I want to bring that up because in your new lives as counselors, as coaches, helping others, it is so important to help them reevaluate their relationship with technology. Because we are not just distracted by technology, we are increasingly enslaved by technology and addicted to technology. And I love what Eric Barker wrote. He said, those who can sit in a chair undistracted for hours, mastering subjects and creating things will rule the world, while the rest of us frantically and futilely try to keep up with texts, tweets, and other incessant interruptions. And I speak as somebody who runs a 24-7 a media operation, who is on every social media thing ever invented. But what I have realized and practice is you need boundaries. You need time off. You need regular digital detoxes. <laughs> That's why the whole idea of the Shabbat was so important and continues to be whatever religion you are or if you are no religion at all. Because after all, what God was trying to say is that human beings were not designed to be on 99% of the time. After all, when she created the world in six days, <laughs> took a day off, not because I believe she really needed to. After all, she's all powerful and omnipresent and omnipotent and all that stuff. I think she was sending us a message but we have forgotten it. And now we need to bring it back in our lives. And we need to demonstrate that that's a much more effective way to run our lives and to achieve while at the same time remembering the soul line. In fact, at the Huffington Post, we just launched a new vacation tool that I tried for the first time when I was in Greece last month, and it's amazing. Um, if you had sent me an email while I was on vacation, you would have gotten an email back that said, Ariana is on vacation until August 11th. If this email is urgent, contact so-and-so. If it is not, I want you to know that this email will be deleted. So you need to email her again on August 11th. It's just amazing. It's transformational because otherwise... <laughs> Otherwise, what happens is that you get that out-of-office email we all get, and then five minutes later, you get an email from that person. Because we are all addicted. And if we see it in our inbox, like Pavlovian dogs, we feel compelled to respond. 
Also, I know that a lot of what I'm saying you already know. But I want to say a couple of things that maybe you don't know. Do you know, for example, that 20% of millennials use their smartphones during sex? <laughs> and do you know that half of women would rather go for a month without sex than without their smartphones? It's OK, sex is part of spiritual psychology, too. I checked with Ron and Mary, no problem. <laughs> Also, we are all somehow under the illusion that multitasking makes us more efficient. In fact, multitasking does not exist. It's really task switching, and it's one of the most inefficient and stressful things we can do. And it also means that we miss life. Uh, when I stopped multitasking, which is what everybody in New York where I live does, you can hardly walk down the street of New York without seeing people on their phones or texting and expecting you to get out of the way, because clearly, if you're just walking, you can't be as important as they are, <laughs> because you have the time to just walk. So when I just started <laughs> just walking, I would just notice things. Like I remember going by a building near my apartment in Soho and saying to a friend I was with, this building is so beautiful. When did it go up? And she said, 1890. <laughs> So what else are we missing? So as one of my favorite poets, Mary Oliver, said, instructions for living a life. Pay attention. Be astonished. Tell about it. And I want to ask you, when you tell about it, to tell about it on the Huffington Post. <laughs> In fact, really, we would love to have every single one of you become a Huffington Post blogger and share your experiences and share your knowledge and wisdom, because it can help so many people. And as we are now in 15 countries around the world, we'd love to translate it in other languages, because you really are pioneers. And you can help so many people follow on this path. And to make it super easy for you to bypass the growing Huffington Post bureaucracy, I'm going to give you my email address, but you can't use it when I'm on vacation. <laughs> and this is Ariana at HuffingtonPost.com. When you found a company, you get the good email address. So when I was growing up in Athens, Greece with Agape, you know, we were taught things that Socrates said, like know thyself, or the unexamined life is not worth living. But I always thought that these were like philosophical platitudes. And it took me a while to realize, as you all know now, that they're actually guiding truths for life. And if we miss that connection with ourselves, if we miss that critical relationship, everything else, in some way or other, falls apart. And that's why reconnecting with ourselves and recognizing that in order to do that, we need to disconnect from our technologies is one of the key things for our time. Because there was a study recently done by Harvard and the University of Virginia where they brought people in one by one and they asked them if they would, be, if they would prefer to be alone in a room without devices, books, anything for 15 minutes or get electric shock. And 67% of men chose electric shock. <laughs> I'm happy to say that among the superior sex women, only 25% chose electric shock. <laughs> but the point is that we are getting so uncomfortable with this relationship with ourselves that we'd rather have electric shock than that. So that's really the major course correction that needs to happen. And the time is ripe, right now, because there is this collective longing to stop living in the shallows. This collective longing to recognize that life, as you have learned at USM, is shaped from the inside out. And you can lead the way, and you will have the wind at your back, because that's what our times are demanding. A 
lot of people here talked about being of service. And of course, being of service is such a critical part of USM's teachings. And one of the reasons why our culture is so bad at recognizing all the good things happening, all the examples of service and compassion and innovation and ingenuity, is because those of us in the media tend to live by the precept that if it bleeds, it leads. And we are changing that at the Huffington Post by launching an initiative called What's Working, where we are going to be putting the spotlight only on good things happening. We're going to be covering everything else, but we want to give you an accurate picture of the world. And right now... <laughs> you, anytime you notice something good, whether you're involved in it or not, someone being of service, someone making a difference, something that's working, please send it to us. Because we believe profoundly that right now, media are helping create copycat crimes. We want to help create copycat solutions, and you can be part of the solution. So it's really reimagining journalism to be something different than it has been for decades now. As you go out in the world, we all know that the obstacles and the challenges are not going to go away. One of the things that won't go away is the fact that the world will keep sending you endless signals to stay connected with everything except yourself. And that's when I have a saying that I have laminated and carried in my wallet by Ian Thomas, who said, every day the world will grab you by the hand and tell you this is important and this is important and this is important and you must worry about this and this and this and you must yank your hand back and put it on your heart and say, no, this is important. Because, let's face it, if we are lucky, we have 30,000 days to play the game of life. How we play depends on what we value, and I'm not being morbid. As the Onion headline put it, death rate holds steady at 100%. <laughs> you know, in ancient Rome, they used to carve MM, memento mori, on statues and trees. Not because they're morbid, but because they wanted to put everything in perspective. And if you've been to a memorial recently, you realize that our eulogists have very little to do with our LinkedIn profiles. <laughs> have you ever been to a memorial where you heard somebody say, you know, George was amazing, he increased market share by one third. <laughs> And so since we know that our eulogies are about all the other things, it's really important to remember them in our daily lives. And your experience over the last two years has really opened you up to this dimension of a deeper spiritual reality. And when we are connected to it. It is much easier to achieve everything you've achieved here, healing lifelong limiting beliefs and patterns, cultural conditioning, and forgiving. Forgiving others, forgiving ourselves. I always think, you know, if Nelson Mandela could leave his jail after 27 years and forgive his jailers and torturers, so can we. I love what he said as he left his jail. He said, as I walked out the door toward the gate that would lead to my freedom, I knew if I didn't leave my bitterness and hatred behind, I'd still be in prison. So, dear graduates, let me wrap up by saying that as you go out in the world, bring joy and loving and gratitude into every moment, including the tough ones. 
And remember that upward and onward is no longer enough. It's now upward, onward, and inward. Thank you.